Welcome, Yuval. The stage is yours. For the introduction and thanks for the invitation to present this talk. Thanks everyone for coming here. It's a pleasure to see so many people. Um, because this is online, I'm going to cut off half of the jokes because I don't want them to be outside. So anyway, um, you know, we have a problem uh, with cryptography. Cryptography is a cost. No one really wants cryptography except for some academics that uh, get grants for that and the programmers that get money for that. But we have to have that. It's like why we have locks on doors and cars. Uh, it's necessity of life. And being a cost, we want it to be as efficient as possible so the cost is minimized. And to be efficient, we resort to techniques like hand-tuned code. We write uh, assembly code, or those who know how to do that, they write assembly code that is uh, especially tuned for the processor, for the cryptographic scheme, and is most efficient uh, that they can do. We use techniques like loop and rolling to uh, reduce the uh, cost of loops and other optimization techniques. And knowing how to do that requires a high level of expertise. On the other side, cryptography also needs to be secure because if it is not secure, then why do we have that at all? And to be secure, that means that it has to be correct. If it is not correct, then uh, it can be broken. And it's been demonstrated uh, many, many times. So the current uh, state of the art, we want it to be provably correct. We run our code, uh, we test our, we get a correction proof that our code does what we really expect it to do. The other thing that it needs to be correct, uh, to be secure is needs to be leak, leak free. We don't want internal values of the uh, cryptographic scheme to leak outside because that breaks the cryptography. And again, this requires high level of expertise, either for running proof systems or for verifying that code doesn't leak. And the problem with high expertise is that it is extremely expensive. So we end up paying a lot of money to people who know how to do that, or we tell them we pay them a lot of money if they're in academia, and uh, and they continue to and they and they write our code for us, and that's expensive. We don't want that. So uh, my aim in this research, and this is a new research direction for me, uh, is to try and reduce this cost by automating things. Uh, and we will look at two approaches that we have used for that, and uh, hopefully we'll learn something. So the first is a work called Rosita, a collaboration with quite a few people. And it, let me present it. So issue of side channel attacks, we have this guy, how many recognize? This is Paul Kocher, okay? Paul Kocher in 1996, a biologist by uh, education. So uh, in 1996, Paul Kocher realized that when we have a computing device and that computing device does cryptography, we can attach probes to the power or just listen to electromagnetic sequences, that, uh, the uh, signals that come out of the device, plug them to a oscilloscope, get some traces, and from that, find the key. And that was 1996. Since then, the area has grown. Uh, we have uh, conferences dedicated to finding these leaks, break, uh, fixing these leaks, uh, find, breaking again. So uh, people make careers out of that. And that's what is done. And one of the things, one of the techniques that we use for protection is called masking. So we have a secret value K and we want to protect it. What we do is we select a random value M and we combine, yes, we combine the secret value and the mask. And what happens is if either of those leaks then we haven't leaked anything. These are uniformly distributed and uh, everything is secure. That's nice in theory. It looks well on, on the paper, but then comes the computer pipeline. And when we send the value through the pipeline, the pipeline keeps copies of that in registers or other storage elements in the pipeline. And when we send another value, 
it interacts with stored values in the pipeline, and that leaks information. So we might get the secret value leaking, even though in the program we don't see it, we don't see these values ever uh, being together. So how do we solve this? To solve this, we have the program here, and what she does, she writes the cryptographic scheme, puts it on a device, gets traces from the device, finds where it leaks, applies her expertise to fix the code, and repeat the process. Now, this programmer has to be expert in writing cryptographic code, and she also needs to be expert in running uh, the device and looking at the oscilloscope and, and, and understanding what's happening there. It is quite a unique expertise, and because it is unique and required, it costs money. So uh, what we want to do, I want to improve this case, this thing. We just want to take this programmer and take her out of the loop, okay? She'll still do the expert thing of writing the code, but we can make the code secure without her, we hope. And for that, what we need is we need two automated things. One is we need to be able to analyze the code to make sure that it doesn't leak or to find out where it leaks. And the other thing is we need to be able to fix the code based on the leak that we have found. So to analyze the code, uh, it's very, it's a problem because this is physical. We cannot automate physical processes. It's hard to do that. So instead, we want to use a simulator of the leakage. Unfortunately, in 2017, Mekan et al. published ELMO, uh, an emulator of the leakage from uh, devices. Now, ELMO is nice. It can find the leakage between uh, consecutive instructions, but it is not completely realistic and to do side channel protection, we need a realistic uh, uh, emulator. So our first task is to make Elmo more realistic, uh, find leakages that are not just from consecutive instruction. The way we do it is very simple. We take two instructions, we plug values of two shares of the masking scheme into the, these instructions. We separate them with some random data so we know that it is not leaks from consecutive instructions. And we run an analysis of leakage. We see if these instructions somehow interact. If we see the value that these two shares they combine to hide, then we know that something is leaking. And we get some traces. And the real trace in light blue, we see that there is leakage. I'll not go into the details of what it actually means. Anything that crosses the red line is a leak. We know we don't cross the red lines. Elmo doesn't recognize leaks in these cases. After we fixed, we added the fact that there is a leakage to the model, then we suddenly, we start seeing leakage. So now we know how to find leakage. After we find leakage, we need to be able to fix it. So how do we do that? How do we find out how to clear this state? It's very simple. We have two instructions, A, that set some state and we put them again separated by some random uh, data put shares of data in the in that instruction in the middle we put random value if we see the combination of the shares leaking it means that the instruction in the middle did not wipe the the share the state completely otherwise we know that we have cleared the state Typically, using the same instruction with the random data will do that because it stores the same place. And that allows us to tell which instructions. Uh, we, we cannot identify the real storage. We don't know what the storage is, black box, the processor. But at least we can say which instructions can wipe the states that other instructions set. And we create some groups, and we know how to do that. And now we can fix things. So to fix things, once we find the leak, we need to first find the root cause, what causes this leak, which of the storage components. And if this is leakage from neighboring instructions, we just need to add another instructions between the two leaking instructions. If this is leakage from storage elements, we need to erase this storage element. So what does it look in real life? Uh, we have the model of Elmo. Elmo uses the linear model of the of the of the uh, instruction, so it gets some variables that are used in the instructions, multiply them by uh, 
pre-calculated constants, and then we use some uh, analysis, some statistical analysis to find the, um, in this case, it's the statistical T value, anything above four and a half is considered a leak. And we see that in this example, the, the fourth instruction leaks because it has a value of more than 50. To find the root cause now is very simple because we have the model. We just do this, the, the statistical analysis on each of the model elements separately. So we have the leakage and we do it on each of the model elements separately. We look at the line and we find out which variable leaks. And because we know what these variables represent, because we build our analysis on that, we can now fix it. So for example, if we know that this leaks here because the values of two consecutive instructions interact, all we have to do is put something in the middle and suddenly the leak, leak disappears. So now we have a process that takes the software, run it through Elmo, find whether it, where it leaks and why, fixes that, and we repeat that until all leaks disappear, until we uh, decide that we don't know what to do. We take an encryption scheme. So this is an implementation. I think it was the, uh, S by, uh, the S box of AES. And when we run the leakage, this is real leakage from the device. We see that it leaks in the around cycles, cycle 500. After we fix it, leaks disappeared. So we fix it on software we, without actually touching the device. After that, the fix disappears. Same for ChaCha, leaks almost disappear around Five, around 700, we see a small peak that goes there, but the leak is much smaller. It almost disappears. And there is some costs to this between 15 and 65% in the examples that we tried, but that's a small price to pay for security, we hope. Questions so far? All clear, beautiful. So let's move to the second uh, topic. Second topic, Cryptopt. Uh, this is again collaboration all over the world. There were much less organizations when we, or institutions when we started that, but uh, three people left Adelaide and moved each to a different place. So we have three more institutions there. Work has been done by uh, Joel that did the optimizer and the Andres and the Jason that did the uh, a verification and the others that helped. So each one did its part and I'm doing this talk. That's what the name, how we get the name there, typical professor work. So what is crypto? Let's look at finite field arithmetic, operation that is used in many uh, encryption schemes, uh, mostly uh, pre-quantum and uh, there are some post-quantum that uh, use it and uh, oh, there were, there were investigated until recently. Um, there are several ways that we can address writing code for these finite field arithmetic. We can write generic code. We have a field, which numbers are represented as, as an array of uh, values. We have generic multiply operation. We just implement this in C and it's beautiful, it works. It's reusable because we can take this C code and run it on everything that supports C up to the compatibility issues within C itself, but let's ignore those for now. Now, this is nice, but it is not very efficient. So what we can do, we can do code that is field specific. When we do the code field specific, we suddenly, many of the condition code disappear and, and we can make our code much more uh, tailored to our field. This is beautiful for performance. Performance improves significantly. It's bad for portability because if someone comes up with a new elliptic curve that uses another field and it's so much more beautiful, so much more secure and so much people love it so much because it has some random names inside the uh, encoding of numbers, then uh, we, we, uh, we cannot use our code. We need to write the code again. So there is a cost, but we get some uh, there is cost of usability, but we get performance. We can be even more uh, specialized. We can start representing the numbers in different way. We can do, do saturated versus unsaturated uh, 
representations. We can start working in the Montgomery representation. It, it doesn't matter if you don't know what these names mean. It's just ways of representing numbers that, that will be more specific to what we do. And then we get better performance and we lose reusability. If we want, we can tailor our code to our processor. Code that is written for a specific processor will look one way. Code that for another processor will look slightly different. And even if we're using a portable language that will let, make the code run on both of them, if we run the code that was targeted for Intel architecture on a RISC-V, it will be slower than code that was targeted for RISC-V there. And finally, we can write everything in assembly, and then we cannot move the code between architectures. Sometimes we cannot even move the code between different versions of the same architecture. So uh, as usual, we get what we get in all cases of trade-offs, we get some curve. There is one aspect of this curve that is not highlighted here, and that how much do we need to trust in our code? So everything that uses a compiler need to trust the compiler because we write our code in our language, in whatever language we write it, but the compiler changes the code. It makes it executable and in the process it changes it. And sometimes, or most times, it will produce what we expected it to produce, but sometimes it does not. So we need to trust our compiler. And trusting compiler is difficult unless we have a compiler that we have verified. And if we have a compiler that we have verified, it will not produce, it will not give us the same uh, performance that of the shelf compilers give us. So in this project, what we want to do is the usual, we want to move the curve in that direction. So how do we do that? Oh, so before I get there, what are the challenges that we have there? Uh, First channel ch challenge that we have, we, we need to reason about how the processor uses the, uh, gen, uh, processes, the processes the code. If we don't know how our processor processes the code, we cannot generate optimal code for that processor, right? It's very uh, easy to see. The, so for example, here's a challenge, question for you. We know that registers are faster for memory. Everyone knows that, right? We know that. Now, our programs use scalar registers, and we sometimes run out of registers, so we need to spill them. And the standard way to spilling them is to write them to the stack and then read back the data when we need it. But there is another set of registers. There are vector registers that are, our programs don't use. Sometimes programs use those, but our programs don't use. So how about instead of writing registers that when run, run out of registers, instead of writing to memory, we transfer to another register, to vector register. When we need the value again, we transfer back, avoiding use of memory. We tried that. Can anyone guess what the performance gain is? One percent, five percent, ten percent? Lower, <laughs> negative, we lose performance, okay? So now there are two ways of, we tried that, we lose two to 3%. We tried that, we try to understand why it happens because we want to know why we lose performance and why our beautiful logic doesn't work in reality. And the answer is, there, there are two ways to answer it. One way is we can start talking about what instructions executes and what delays happens there in the process and why all happens. There is a sim another way that we can reason about it, and that says, if we look at programs, most programs tend to read data that they have written recently. Yeah? Virtually no program writes data to vector register only to read it back again. When processor designs need to optim designers need to optimize their machine, they will optimize it to the case that people use. No one will optimize it for something that no one uses. And that's why it is fair. It, we, in, without even doing the experiment, we should have known. It's very why it's very easy to know things in retrospect. It's we are like every like most people smart in retrospect. And benefits of hindsight. But that what that tells us is that everything that we try to reason about what the processor does, 
is very hard. It, it's, it, we can't easily do that. And compiler designers do try to do that and they, they are pretty good. So most compilers will produce code that is faster than most people can generate for the same problem. It takes a lot of expertise to do something that is faster than what compilers do. The other problem that we have is specific to cryptography. And I know that cryptography is thought to be very complex and it's a field that no one really understands. But the reality is cryptographic code is extremely simple. Cryptographic code is extremely simple because we said we do unrolling, do unrolling that reduces the number of branches there. So we have just linear code. Uh, we don't have branches on secret values because if we have branches on secret values, then the code is not secure there. We, this is something that has been shown several times. Oh, I have a few papers just because of that, of secret branches. And we have simple memory access patterns, both because we cannot have memory access patterns that depends on secret, and because uh, we want to be able to analyze the code. So we end up with code that and that we understand quite well. Uh, it's, it's relatively simple, large. What it has, it has large basic blocks. It has large sequences of instructions with no branch, just exec code execution. And this is not typical for standard programs. Standard programs tend to have a branch every roughly 20 instructions. Compiler designers, when they design their compiler, they put the focus on standard programs. They need to pass or need to improve spec benchmarks because no one cares about other performance. Uh, they don't look much at improving uh, 1,500 uh, instructions that it takes to do full, full, multi full multiplication in SEC P521. That's not what they're focused on. So the result is that we have simple code that compilers don't know to handle well. So, and so this is an opportunity for, for us. So our approach to do better is first-year programming. Uh, how many of you taught first-year programming class? Not many. What you remember will not probably not be relevant because if you are sitting here, you are unlikely to have been the typical programmer, a first-year student uh, in programming classes. Um, when First year programming class the students, they start to learn programming. They, we give them a task. A task is a sort the, these a typical classical a problem. Sort the, these grades, uh, the students by their grades and tell us who is the third uh, best student in, the, in this lecture. And what they do, they write code. And they write code and they run it. And it does not work because they don't know how to program. That's, it takes time to learn how to program. So they modify the code. And now they test whether the new code is better than the old code. And if it is better, then they modify again and try again until they get it right. If it is not better, they revert to the original code and continue the process. And this process continues until five minutes before the deadline, then submit it and complain about the, the grade. Now, fortunately, most, univers most students in most universities manage to get uh, beyond this stage after first year. But that's how they start to do it. And what we are trying to do is basically automate first year students. I like to refer to that like fuzzing. Fuzzing, you know, it's like getting enough monkeys to type on a keyboard. We are better than monkeys. We take first year students. Um, professionally, we have a name for this approach. It's called random local search. It exists in the, uh, in the area of uh, evolutionary computation. There are other approaches, but this is the one that we chose. Basically, what we do, we generate code that implements the function, modify it, test whether the new code is faster than the old code, and take whichever one of is faster. So now we need to look at two main operators, one, how to write code, and the other, how to modify code. So how to write code, uh, we have an example function. Don't try to think what it does. It's nothing, it's just for an example. We look at our function and we see that we can do addition of X and Y. So we do addition of X and Y. 
And then we can see, we see that we can calculate the square of Z. So we do multiplication to calculate square of Z. And then we can multiply Z by the sum and add the result or two results and we got everything. Now these are still abstract operations. This is not code. So on x86 architecture, we have multiple instructions that can implement everything, every uh, operation. So we now need to choose which instruction we use. So for example, we can take ADCX, which does addition with carry in uh, of, of words. And this will give us some code that does the addition, okay? And then for the multiply, we choose mul x and we get the code that does the square. And for the second multiply, we use mul x. And for the third addition, we use add and we get the result. This is how we generate code. And what we do is we choose the order of operations at random at the beginning and we choose the operation, the, the implementation template at random. So we got a random implementation of this function. That's the first step. Now we need to start modifying. So in this case, we see that we can move mul2 to be before mul1 because it does not depend on it. So we do that. And that will also change the order of execution here. And in this program, it will not matter because this program runs too fast for any microarchitectural effects to take a place. But in other programs, sometimes just changing the order that we do instructions make the program faster or slower. So we can try that. Another thing that we can try is we can look at this ADCX and change it to an add, okay? This at the top there, we change it to an add. And this is beautiful because now we don't need the, uh, to clear the carry. We have one instruction less. It doesn't mean that the code is faster. It could be slower, but we have different code that does the same thing and we can test it. So we have the operators, we can write code, we can modify code, we run the code and test what is faster and what, whether it's faster or slower, and we get something like that as we progress. So what we have here, horizontal axis is the number of modifications that we have tried. This is a log scale because it becomes very boring if it is not. In the vertical axis, we have uh, the speed up compared to one is uh, optimized, uh, is the same code uh, compiled with uh, GCC dash O3 dash MR. So we optimize as much as GCC allows us to the specific architecture it runs on. And we see that we start with a 10% slower than the code that GCC produces with random code. But as we progress, our code gets better. And it gets better in this specific example, it gets better to be 60% faster than GCC, which is quite a nice achievement. Okay, so now we have that and we have the question. So we have an optimizer. Now we need to get code for this optimizer. We need to, to have functions that, code for functions that we need to optimize. And because our optimizer take a very specific uh, format, so the format is easy, we can translate formats, but what it takes is the, it's, it's the sequence of instructions that is in a, what's called the SSA format, uh, language from compilers. Basically it means that Every sign we do a single assignment to variables, and if and we never assign replace the value, and we need something that doesn't have a flow control and something that may have limited memory access patterns because our optimizer doesn't know, doesn't want even to know how to handle these. Because once we start handling these, we start getting side channels leaking in. So we need some source of code, and for that we took Fiat cryptography. This is a project uh, published in 2019. What fiat cryptography does, it takes a functional representation of a field operation. So it has some sort of template on how to implement field operations. And it produce fiat IR in intermediate representation, which is a straight line. It's SSA, so it's exactly what we need. It's not by chance that it's exactly what we need. We present it here in different order. We started with that, but that's the way we, it's, the story sounds much nicer if we tell it that way. Anyway, Fiat from this Fiat IR has two ways, has some backends that take Fiat IR 
compile it, generate from its C code or generate Go code. And what we added, we had a back, a, a, another backend that creates a JSON encoded IR. So it's IR represented as a JSON file. The reason that we use JSON is that our optimizer is written in TypeScript. And the reason that our optimizer is written in TypeScript is that I learned that when a student comes and says that they want to use TypeScript and not Go, they let them use TypeScript. It's usually better. Anyway, we now can plug this into our program, into our optimizer. And at the end, we get some assembly code. How does this assembly code compare across functions? So here are the function, the, the uh, field. Or these fields are typically field for curves. So we call them by the name of the curves that they belong to. And for example, for curve 25519, our code is about 15% faster than produced by the compilers. Okay, we can com continue and run that. Uh, numbers, higher numbers are better, smaller numbers are worse. Color codes are blue better, orange worse. And we see that for most curve, we get significant improvement. Uh, Compared to Clang, we get around 20%. Compared to GCC, we get much more. And there are some problems with the way that GCC processes this code in that case. If anyone wonders what happens in Curve 448, uh, we don't know. So if you find out, we'll be delighted to understand. But uh, overall, the thing works. This is sort of... Same problem that we get with machine learning. We don't know why it really works. We also don't understand our code. So, so we tried looking at the code and see what makes it faster than other code. We don't know. It, what we know is it doesn't look like anything that a person would write. So we, it, it, the whole structure is weird. Field element is nice, but we need to use field element in operations. So we try to use it with some uh, code that does scalar multiplication. We compare to other scalar multiplication implementations. Our specific implementation, we look, OpenSSL comes with two implementations for care of 25519. Um, what we do is we take uh, OpenSSL, that's the uh, dark gray, that's their implementation. And we take that and replace the field operations with our field operations. OpenSSL field operations are handwritten, so it's, it's tailored to, to, to be the best performance that whoever wrote this did. And uh, our is generic implementation. It comes out of Cryptopt. We see that we perform almost the same as, uh, or roughly the same uh, ballpark as hand optimized codings. Uh, if anyone questions, the reason that we perform less well than Huckle Star is that Huckle Star doesn't use a standard field operation. So, so it uses more advanced, uh, Instead of just having multiply and square as field operation, it has a double multiply. So it multiplies two pairs of numbers. And that allows them to uh, improve the uh, pipeline a, a bit. We are working on trying to do the same thing. So overall, we, we end up with code that performs roughly the same as hand optimized. We, we go with generic code that performs roughly as well as hand optimized code. It takes three days to run, depends on how many modifications or mutations you, you try. But three days of uh, three CPU days is something that happens in two hours on Amazon if you're really stringent. And uh, if you try to optimize the code to the level that OpenSSL does, it will cost you several months of top programmers. So it's quite a lot of saving there. Now, Going back to here, another thing that a uh, fiat cryptography does is that it has a proof, a correctness proof, that the fiat IR implements uh, the function correctly. So the, there is a proof of correctness that comes with, uh, with fiat cryptography. And that means that code that generated from fiat IR is correct. There is no proof of correctness for the backend. So the C is not necessarily exactly the same. We don't have a proof that it is exactly the same as the IR. It's hard to see where it will go wrong, but it might get wrong. And definitely there is no proof of correctness that goes from the C to the assembly 
or in standard compilers. So we might lose some of the correctness. The same applies to our assembly code. So we don't have any proof of our code and this process is a weird process. It's hard to prove anything about. Instead of trying to prove anything about it, what we have is an, we have an equivalence checker that takes fiat IR and takes x86 assembly, only limited x86 assembly, the one that we produce, and checks that they are equivalent. And this equivalence checker, we have a proof that it is correct. So it comes with a proof that it is correct. So it carries the proof from fiat IR to, to our assembly code. And now we end up with assembly code that is proven correct up to the functional implementation, which is also proven correct, and is faster. The performance is faster than uh, the one that we get from other, in other ways. So back here, we moved crypto. We managed to achieve the uh, the improvement that we wanted. Uh, if you want, code is available. And yep. So in summary. We have two uh, methods for generating automatic, uh, for automatically generating, generating code. We have the crypto that generates uh, optimized code from a uh, functional specification. We have Rosita that automatically removes side channel leakage. Uh, the things that enable this are the fact that cryptography has simple code, the fact that we don't use the actual hardware in Rosita, and the fact that we do real evaluations instead of uh, trying to model the pipeline and uh, understand how fast it would work. There is still a lot of to do. We currently only support field elements. It, this may work for a entity. This may work for other things that are used in cryptography. This may even work for things that are outside cryptography. Um, we can we need implementations for ARM, we need implementations for risk 5 we need implementations for, I don't know what processor people like. Optimization is very simple. There are things to implement there to improve to genetic algorithms or a simulated annealing or whatever optimization we want to use. There is a question whether we can remove the overhead of Rosita by using techniques similar to crypto by trying to optimize the code there. And there are other things in cryptography that I probably cannot think about now, uh, that there are a lot of repetitive tasks that we do when we develop cryptographic code that hopefully might uh, optimize them. So our aim basically is stop wasting smart people's time. We don't want them to write code if we can do it automatically. And we believe that there is a lot of low hanging fruit around. So if anyone wants to investigate something similar, I'll be happy to be in touch. I'll be happy to discuss. So that's, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>